the Department of Justice is basically saying Google is so powerful and so controllingly dominant that nobody can conceivably come up against it. Uh, in previous lawsuits, uh, antitrust lawsuits in the United States, the most uh, noteworthy one was back in the 1980s. The telephone companies were broken up. They were regulated. We had, we had several telephone companies before the Internet, uh, before people had access to the Internet. People used the telephone for just about everything. And one or two dominant players owned basically the United States, and the government intervened and said, you're too powerful, you're inhibiting competition from other companies. Here's my question for you. We're going to start off talking about Google itself. Is Google too powerful? What are your thoughts? Yes, sir. So we're talking about, this is about as pure capitalism as it gets in terms of they became a dominant player, uh, the industry, people love them, and they use the product. So, so we have a vote for no, they're, they're a capitalistic endeavor. Other thoughts, guys? Agree or disagree? Is this a company that has become too powerful? Keep going. Well, it's like, you know, you're in a situation where maybe you just use the call set, like, whereas we would want to Well, the fun thing about it, the last time we had a big case like this, well, we can talk about Microsoft, which is a little different, but we had the telephone companies in the 80s. Uh, the folks who were pushing for it, actually, the, the administration at the time was the Reagan administration, and Reagan was very pro-business, but he still pushed for the breakup, which is kind of surprising. So we've got, uh, Nick's opinion is we're okay keeping things as they are. Does anybody share that opinion or feel differently? What are your thoughts? Is Google too powerful or not? What are your thoughts? First question, how many of you have used Google in the last 24 hours? We're all Google fans in here. So, are they too powerful or not? Abby, what do you think? Are they too powerful or not? Tell me your opinion. I don't know what you find on Yahoo. Probably the most terrible macaroni and cheese recipe ever, you know? So, nobody uses Yahoo. So, we have a free market and what about the rest of you guys? What are your thoughts? Is Google too powerful or not? Why do you think so? It's what I use too. It's my, it's my default. I love Gmail. I love all the services I get from Google. Is there anybody in this room who disagrees? Because it, it's okay to disagree. Here's my thought on it. I, I think that it's, it's fantastic that a company like Google has done the job they have done. I mean, when we think about what their original mission statement was, it was to have access to all the world's information. That's, that's a tricky point, though, too. We're going to talk a little bit about how Google works to explain how, how that's not exactly true. The other reason that the Department of Justice is getting involved here, because Google has become such an integrated part of our lives, if you're not getting yourself on Google's top search results, you as a company, have to either figure out how to do that, that's called search engine optimization, or to otherwise get the word out about your product. And what the Department of Justice is saying is they feel that Google has too much power in determining which companies get recognition. So that's the impetus for the lawsuit. I leave it to you guys to decide for yourselves if that's good or bad. But here's my question. Would you want to take on Google if you were a company? Just for the same reason you wouldn't want to take on Amazon. Are there ways to compete, however? I'll give you an example. Now, we all shop on Amazon. Is there anybody here who doesn't? I, I bet everybody in the last two months, who here has bought something on Amazon? Me too. But here's the thing. Companies are figuring out a way. Here's a secondary question to that. Because if you've ever talked to me about shoes, and I don't know, I don't know why anybody would talk to me about shoes. I'm an old man. But I love Nikes. Has anybody here ever ordered a custom pair of Nikes? Yeah, they turn around pretty quick, don't they? So you can't get custom Nikes from Amazon, and that's how companies who have lost their online de dominance to companies like Amazon are, are figuring out a way. You get free shipping from Nike. You can get, by the way, if you guys are a student, you get a discount from Nike for being a student or a veteran or anybody involved in education. So companies are figuring out a way. 
there are companies that are coming up with ways to compete with Google as well. Has anybody ever used Waze? Why is Waze, why is Waze so awesome, by the way? That's exactly why Waze is awesome. It shows us where the cops are. And, and on top of that, too, I love it because I have it set to the end of October that it talks to me like Batman. Like Batman's giving me directions. I love it. You know, it's really cool and it's fun. There are, seriously, it's like, you know, it says, what is it? Hazard reported ahead. It might be a Gotham City. I love that. But it, they come up with ways to compete. It's going to be interesting, though. We're going to track this story over the next couple of weeks to see what the Department of Justice ultimately decides in this lawsuit. Any other thoughts, guys? Yes, sir. They might, they might get reimbursed for like court costs or something. But honestly, I think for Google, that's that's dust off their ledger sheet. When you think about what this company is worth, I mean, did you did anybody catch what the company's valuation is? It's over a trillion dollars. Like so, they, Google's Google's value is greater in terms of dollars than most countries on the planet. So I don't think I don't think Google's lawyers are sweating it if they're going to be billing too many hours. I think they're going to be fine. But yeah, they can get court costs back. They can get reimbursed. It is interesting though because this is not a uh, this is not a pro business kind of stance that the DOJ is taking at this point. So I'll be interested to see how it plays out. Keep going, man. Be random. Oh boy, that's a good question. Do you think he's got a chance of going to jail? Sure. Here's what I'll say about Facebook, and it's it's been funny because Zuckerberg. By the way, have you guys ever seen the movie The Social Network? Fantastic film. Have you seen it? It's a, it's a really good story. He, he's not a. You know, He's not always been a very good person. And so when you get down to any time Facebook has been negatively in the news, I'll give you an example. A couple years ago, Facebook rolled out this thing where by a default setting, uh, Facebook was doing facial recognition on you and all your friends. It's kind of creepy, right? So people were like, this is terrible, and they uh, and they took it away. Then a couple years ago, during the last election, they allowed a company called Cambridge Analytica to get in and have access to people's news feeds. They can determine who you wanted to vote for, and they targeted advertising to you based on who you were voting for. And basically, that came out. Facebook said, we won't do it again. Every time Facebook does something bad, it makes the news, people get upset about it, and then it goes away. And I think part of the reason for that is so many damn people use it. Do you guys know how many global users Facebook has? Take a, take a guess. Two billion. It's like a substantial a part of the population of the planet uses Facebook. And Facebook, actually, more people have Facebook and mobile phones on the planet than running water. That's that's how big of a deal Facebook is. So that company, despite the unethical things they seem to repeatedly do, is not an easy company to take down. Will Zuckerberg go to jail? Um, this Keep in mind, even though I'm recording this, my, my, uh, my precursor for the following statement is I am not an attorney. Zuckerberg can afford pretty good lawyers. I don't know if I ever see him going to jail. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I don't know if I would see it happen. Just like the people, for example, who were behind the stock market crash of 2008, none of them saw jail time either. It's because you got the money for the good lawyer. If he did. Oh, I think it initially would plummet. But uh, if somebody else took it over, like, what's Facebook's biggest problem right now, other than other than the stuff I just mentioned? What's their biggest problem? There's lots of competition. Do you get, yes? Go ahead. Yeah. Do you guys do you guys get excited about using Facebook? Dude, tell me why you use Facebook. Damn. Yeah, your your older relatives, your people my age and older. You know the fastest growing user, the fastest growing group of Facebook users is over the age of 65. Is that a demographic you want to be in for your company? So I would say they came up with a new uh, lead who somehow made Facebook cool again for people under the age of 45, then you might see the stock go up. Well, people, 
it's like that utility function. Some people still use it for that. And also, I know, for example, in the college market, people use Facebook because it's very easy for events and promoting external. But, but people, they, they seriously do use it a lot. And here's the reason why colleges use it so much, even though you guys don't use it, your parents. Yeah. Yes. They do. In fact, it's, it's so funny because a lot of people your age, your top two social networks at this point in time are Instagram and, well, actually TikTok. Not TikTok, um, uh, Snapchat. Uh, TikTok's not picking up as quickly as they thought it would, and uh, Snapchat seems to be the one you guys go to. All right, last question before we get in. You can ask more questions, but my last question for you. How many of you are just as likely to use Snapchat as text messaging? Yeah, quite a few people are using that as kind of their default communication tool now, too. And I think that's something that Facebook would have to really tap into to get popular again with your generation. Any other thoughts, guys? Hey, keep the conversation going. I always, if you guys are interested in something and it's got a business bent to it, I would always rather get to talk about things that are interesting to you guys. But because we're talking about Facebook and because we're talking about Google, we're talking about corporations. Guys, corporations is where business gets big. We talked about sole proprietorships. We talked about partnerships. Corporations basically are entities that can be perpetual. Even though Henry Ford died a long time ago, we still have Ford Motor Company. Even though a lot of companies were founded by people long dead, we still have them as part of our lexicon of names. Well, corporations have to operate within the law of where they're, they're, they're operating. If you're a corporation, you can essentially act like a living thing. You can have contracts. You can own property. And you can be sued as well. We refer to it, guys, as having a life beyond its owners. And what we mean by that separate from its owners. Let's say, for example, we talked about the big short. And we talked about Microsoft. And we talked about AT&T. If AT&T or Microsoft or Google runs afoul of the law, do individuals who work for those companies generally go to jail? No, they don't, because they have separate liability from the company. So that's a life separate from the owners. There's a bunch of different kinds of corporations we're going to talk about. If you want to form a corporation, it ain't hard. If you're going to decide what name you want for your corporation, what's well, something unique, obviously. And then you file something called your Articles of Incorporation. All that means is you're putting down on a form, a government form, why do you exist? If your goal is to make money, you're following as an non-profit or a for-profit corporation. If you are going to have stock, you're going to say that we're going to be publicly traded. You're going to say who your board of directors is, the people who direct the, the company, for example. Those folks are, in certain uh, times can be held liable for decisions in the company, but they're really the folks who are steering the ship, but the ship is its own thing. you got to have bylaws and you got to pay a fee. I'll give you an example, guys. I actually started a corporation myself. Well, actually, mine would be in it. It's called Pass Together Incorporated. We're a nonprofit, and we raise money for a group called the Healing Fest. It's a local charity that provides uh, peer mentoring services to kids with a lot of problems. We raise a lot of money to support that charity. I had to form a corporation because I had to have some way to do my banking. I had to have some way to report my taxes. I had to have some way to be able to follow this stuff. We don't pay taxes because we're a nonprofit, but i got to prove to the government that I'm not misusing the money. It cost me 800 bucks to start a corporation. Now, mine's a nonprofit. But you could do your own corporation for similar filing fees, depending on what kind of corporation you're filing. But you have to have rules that you're operating by. Why does your corporation exist? And this is right out of our text, for example. The things that you might put in your articles of incorporation, in addition to listing your officers, your board of directors, you might also say, for example, uh, where, the, where your corporate office is located. For example, uh, your corporate office, what might determine? Where you choose to locate your office. Any of you accountants out there? What, why might we look in a certain place? Could be competition. What, what else could be beneficial? Any of my accountants, why might you want to locate in one place over another? Say the Cayman Islands. Well, people, you can get people anywhere. I'm thinking Cayman Islands, I'm thinking Ireland. Why might you want to incorporate one of those places? Taxes. 
So where you incorporate, if you incorporate in a state with higher taxes, you may want to say, you know what, we may operate in that state, but we're going to put our, our incorporation, we're going to go mainly to this location. So all those things can determine where you choose to operate. And you're going to have the names and addresses of your board of directors and your articles of incorporation as well. Now we're going to talk, guys, in terms of corporate governance. This is something you well know, but I love this diagram. I think it does a good job. If you are a publicly traded company, here are your stockholders, the people who actually own stock in your company. If you're not publicly traded, you still have what we refer to as stakeholders. Those are people who have a stake in your company, and those folks who are part of your company still are going to elect a board of directors. We're going to keep this at publicly traded because this is a very formal process in a publicly traded company. All the stockholders are the folks who elect the board of directors. If you own 100 shares of stock, you have 100 votes if you have common stock. If you have 50, you've got 50 votes. If you've got 2,000, you've got 2,000 votes. So those folks basically pick the folks who are going to govern the company. Corporate governance, the directors, are the people who pick all the officers of the company. So in essence, you elect the folks who make decisions. It's just like democracy, guys. But here's the trick. If the top officers are making decisions the directors don't like, the directors can fire them. Here's the other thing. The, the directors, if they are making overall corporate decisions that the stockholders don't like, they can vote them out. Check this out, guys, because I trade it at about this much of a, of a level. I own, yeah, you're going to have a hard time believing this, I own two shares of Planet Fitness. Two whole shares. But you know what I get every year? I get a voting form in the mail. I actually get to vote for the board of directors. I know, Eric, you're thinking, man, this guy's a power player. He's got a few whole votes here. I'm going to sway the whole thing. Everybody's on their, their, their you know, pins and needles. Like, what talk are you going to do this year? Who's he going to vote for? It? But I do. I get I get a vote. And the funny thing is, if you own shares of stock, you actually get an invitation. You can show up at the shareholders meeting. One of these days, I want to show up at a shareholders meeting with my stock certificate for my two shares of stock. Tell those folks I got something to say. I doubt they're going to listen to me. But you can do that. I could. I could absolutely do it. It could. You know, that might be fun. I think it for a good YouTube video, don't you think? I didn't want to walk into my local Planet Fitness and ask them to show me around and see how my, uh, my shares were doing. But you guys, in terms of types of corporations, these are the big three. I would take notes on these because I always ask questions about these on an exam. The most basic form of a corporation is what we refer to as a C corp, the C stands for conventional. If we go to the most basic form of corporation ever, we started getting big companies. In the early 1900s, we started getting mega corporations. They were C corps, and that stands for conventional. They typically are publicly traded, but not always. They could be private companies as well. So they are large, they are bureaucratic, and what does the word bureaucratic mean? Anybody know? Because nobody says bureaucracy in a positive way. What does bureaucratic mean? Anybody know? Elena, oh, hey, what's bureaucratic mean? If I say it's a bureaucratic process, what do I mean? The faster slow. It's actually slow. If you talk about somebody, for example, we, we bust on politicians, uh, that, that guy's just a bureaucrat. It's somebody who slows things down. The corporation can be large and slow to change. Not always, but generally speaking, they're big companies. Then we get to an escort. Here's where the escort is interesting. You are limited to 100 people who can own shares in your company. And you have one class of stock. That means everybody votes. You are taxed like a partnership. Is a partnership taxed at a higher or lower rate than a typical corporation? It is lower. That's the advantage. That's why you want this. You, you avoid getting taxed twice on your profits. We very commonly will see S-Corps as larger family businesses because you're keeping it in the family. And there's some other things, too. For example, you can't get more than, don't write this down, don't worry about this, but you can't make more of 20% of your income off what they call passive sources. So if you own parking lots, you can't make all your money from parking lots and get out of all your taxes by making yourself an S-Corp. And everybody in an S-Corp has to be a U.S. citizen by, by United States tax, tax law. Now we get into LLCs, limited liability uh, companies or corporations. These means you these mean you can choose how you want to be taxed. You can be taxed like a partnership or a corporation. You may ask yourself, 
why would you want to make that choice? Isn't it always better to be a partnership? Well, it depends on the state you're in. So you have a choice how you want to be taxed when you have no publicly traded stock. Makes sense so far, so far guys. These are the big three. Now, if you get into this stuff too, there's other kinds of corporations. For example, I'm a nonprofit corporation. So we, we're not talking about that today because we're talking about for-profit corporations. St. Francis University. Oh, this could be a good bonus question. When I always say this could be a bonus question, it's something you should write down. St. Francis University is a nonprofit. We're called a 501c3. We're called a 501c3. And that means we don't pay taxes because we're a nonprofit. Our goal is not profit. Our goal is our mission. With me so far, guys. Okay. Well, actually, let's talk about this for a second. In your own mind, regardless of the quality information that's on these slides, based on what we talked about, what's the advantage? What are the advantages of, of having a corporation? Yeah. You got it. Remember, do you remember what the percentage was? Yeah, you're, you're really close. It, it, depending on what source you read, our tax says it's pretty close to 80. So in terms of corporations make more money, they can operate at a higher level. So that's an advantage. Let's get an advantage over here. What's an advantage to corporations, guys? Give me an advantage. Actually, I'm going to go to the back. So. They're going to survive. They're going to, they're going to be around for the long haul. Derek, can you think? Derek, I'm going for Derek Rand. Derek, can you think of any other advantages corporations might have? disadvantage. Uh, the other part of it too, guys, in terms of, of corporations also get certain tax deductions depending on where you're operating and more people want to invest in a big company because you can buy shares of stock very easily if you're publicly traded. What are some of the disadvantages? Well, corporations, particularly C-Corps, pay the highest amount of taxes. They're complex organizations to run. For example, if you, if you have a partnership, you don't have to worry about HR. Of a partnership, you're not going to be worrying about training hundreds of people. If you've got a corporation, you've got complexity, you've got cost, and you've got more restrictions how you can operate and how you can't. More rules apply to you from the federal and state level. So let's do a quick comparison of these guys. All right, a C Corp typically pays more in taxes than any other, any other company, and the company itself can issue stock. You can have publicly traded stock company has separate liability from the people who own shares of stock. So if I own a share of Google, for example, if I own a share of Planet Fitness, actually it was stick with Google. If I own a couple of shares of Google and Google gets busted by the feds and broken up, am I going to jail? No. I, I might see my dividends go down, but I'm not going to jail. I also have the highest potential for profit in the C Corp because they tend to be the biggest companies. And as, as we stated, we see 80% of the profits and revenue coming out of the United States big companies. Then we get into S-Corps, and again, the tax like sole proprietorships, generally speaking, or partnerships, you can make that, well actually, you can't make a choice in an S-Corp, that's a typo on the slide, they're tax like partnerships. And you can only have 100 people who are coming in to the corporation. Any money you make, if you're a partner in that group, if you own a share of stock in that group, it's tax like personal income, and so you're not getting taxed twice. S-Corps have median potential for profit. Then we have LLCs. You can choose if you want to be taxed like a partnership or a corporation and you have no stock. Lowest potential for profit, but easiest to set up. So guys, what type of corporation should we set up? Let's say we're a biotech firm. We might have a, a cure for AIDS. We might have a cure for COVID too. We got lots of cash and hundreds of employees. What logically type of corporation should we be? Yes. We definitely should be a sequel. Absolutely, because this is going to be a big company. All right, we've got a small investment firm, and we're not interested in going public, and we're still deciding how we want to be taxed. LLC, see where this is going. All right, I need to hear some, somebody over here, too. What type of corporation are we? We want to keep 100 shareholders, and it might be a family business. What do we got? 
We got an S corp. Absolutely. S corp indeed. So, and again, guys, we cover the, the advantages and disadvantages of corporations. Before we get into cooperatives, I'm going to take a sip of my coffee and pause for an opportunity for questions or comments. What would you like to say or ask? What do you think? No, LLCs can be for profits as well. Uh, in fact, most LLCs are for profits. It's people, for example, if, if I owned a trucking company, a small trucking company, I could do it as a sole proprietorship, but then if I if I mess up, they can come take my house, they can come take my property. If I file as an LLC, which you can do, then I've got some separation between my life and my business. That's a great question. Yes. What it really comes down to is the amount of complexity you want to deal with, for example. Like a sole proprietorship versus an LLC. An LLC's got a little bit more paperwork you do with something like with the state. Truth, truth be told, by the way, I'm putting in a little plug. Because I know we got some entrepreneurs in here. We have some people who already own their own businesses. How many of you either already own your own business or want to own your own business someday? There's no better time to start than now. And our SBDC on campus will actually help you with but the paperwork is greater for an LLC. Uh, you're going to have to do more reporting to show how you're separating your finances. For example, if you have a sole proprietorship, there'd be nothing to keep you from commingling your business finances and your personal checking, for example, where an LLC you'd want some separation. So it's just a little bit more co complicated. But seriously, like your tax dollars, your federal tax dollars that everybody in here pays in their income funds our small business development centers. So you already paid into these systems if you've ever earned a dollar in your life. To use those resources, they're available. There's no better time to start a business than when you're in college. All right, guys, in terms of cooperatives, just to, to give you a, a real quick summary of what co cooperatives are, who here has ever heard of a co op? Yeah, that's a great example. What's a college co op? Yeah, we have those kind of co ops. We, we generally speaking, in the, in the business world, we'll have two types of co-ops. We've got buyer co-ops and seller co-ops. A uh, buyer cooperative is a way that we can all come together to buy products or services in a way that will be competitive for us. A great example is Ace Hardware. If you've got an Ace in your neighborhood, they're not a chain. That is an affiliation you make as a cooperative. You say, hey, my local hardware store. Actually, another good one is the IGA. Have you ever seen an IGA grocery store? It's people that come together to buy in bulk so they get better pricing so they can compete with large chains. For example, we have Lowe's and Home Depot. Those are the big names in home development. Ace is much smaller, but for being a part of a co-op, they can get bulk purchasing. So a cooperative is, is that way as well. And then we have seller cooperatives, which means we're going to share our resources so that we can get access to markets. For example, Sunkist buys oranges from a variety of different places, selling them under the Sunkist label, it's actually a seller cooperative. And we also have utility cooperatives. And what that means, guys, is you own your own power company. So those are all examples of cooperatives. And so they're, they're a part of business we don't talk about as much, but it really is the idea of leveraging scale to compete with, with larger companies. And we did all these concept checks, so we're good. We're going to move again to franchise. I know we talked a bit about franchises, so we can go very quickly, guys. What are your favorite franchises? What's your favorite franchise? I love chicken. What, what, what's your favorite franchise? Oh, I don't have one. What's your favorite franchise? Chick fil A. Favorite? Starbucks. Good one. What's your favorite franchise? Lunch? Do you like coffee or donuts? We got a lot of fans of Chick Fil A in here. I have to admit, I love Chick Fil A sandwiches, but I love the Popeye sandwiches too. Guys, a franchisor is somebody who's basically selling you a system. They're selling you a way to make a product or service. And we have product and service franchises all over the country. Whether it's McDonald's, or whether it's a, a, a what's it called, Home Instead. Believe it or not, Home Instead, the senior care center is a franchise as well. The person who decides to open a franchise is a franchisee. So, by the way, guys, did you guys know that we have a local tie to one of the biggest franchises in the world? 
What franchise am I talking about? Yes. It's not Chick Fil A. Well, we do have a local tie there too, but I'm talking about something like where the brand actually got big because of a guy from this region. Sheets is big too, but they're not a franchise. They're all privately owned. It's a good guess. I'll give you the hint. I'll give you a hint. Golden Arches. McDonald's. The guy who franchised McDonald's, the guy who took McDonald's to market, is a guy named Ray Kroc. Have any of you ever seen the movie The Founder? Oh, God, that movie's amazing. So the McDonald brothers in the 1950s came up with a system for making hamburgers. And they could literally take a hamburger from the grill to the time it landed up at the counter in about a minute. So you got a fresh, hot hamburger. And they were selling them for like 50 cents or whatever they were selling them for back then. Ray Kroc took one look at this system and said, everybody in the world should have a McDonald's. And he created the franchise. And he's from near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So the guy who took McDonald's National is from this region. So that's your local tie to franchise. Pretty interesting. And by the, by the way, so you guys, none of you guys have ever seen the founder. Oh, we got to stop for a second. I got to show you guys something. In fact, yeah, you guys got to see this. But you guys,